Greetings everyone, this is Rob Sanders with Simply Learn and welcome to today's webinar. Today we're gonna to talk about digital marketing tools. So fasten your seatbelts and let's get started. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at some of the best digital marketing tools for not only 2019, but ones that have performed well in the past, that are popular, and ones that we foresee as being the go-to tools for the future. So past, present, and future digital marketing tools is the way to look at this uh, with a good focus on a lot of different marketing channels here. So we're gonna focus first on SEO, talk about some of the tools related to on-page and off-page. We're gonna switch over to paid search, talk a little bit about paid search tools. We're going to talk about email marketing and some of the email marketing platforms and the tools within those platforms. The center of it all is web analytics. So Google Analytics is the tool we'll be taking a closer look at in today's webinar and all that it has to offer. Okay, affiliate marketing. We'll talk about some of the tools available to you and for affiliate marketing. We'd be remiss if we didn't talk about social media and all that it has to offer and all the metrics and tools available, all the platforms available. So we'll hone in on a couple of examples there. And then we'll also talk about some competition tools available for you. So there's a whole suite of tools. The one caveat being, hey, if you have your favorite tool, continue using it. In fact, if there's a tool that we didn't mention in today's webinar, feel free to mention it in the comment box below this video. We'd love to hear what you're using to manage your particular digital marketing channel. Okay, and so the goal for today's webinar is, hey, we hope you get something out of this in terms of using new tools. There's some tools that I use, some tools that my colleagues use, everybody uses different tools, so it'd be good to kind of see what else is out there. So if you have something to share, share it. By all means, what we're trying to do is share what we think are you know, best practices and some of the most popular or most used tools out there in the industry. So that's what we're gonna do. The goal is to get you to better understand some of the tools we're using in a little bit more detail. And what we're gonna do is start out with search engine optimization. Okay, so search engine optimization or organic search, we have a mixture of paid and free. So there's a lot of different platforms, but if you're focusing on SEO, you certainly need to use an SEO platform. So there's SEMrush, okay? You also have Google Search Console, which is free. So if you don't have a SEO platform, you definitely need to be using Google Search Console. And so we'll take a closer look at that. There's Google Keyword Planner, which is actually situated under Google Ads. And so if you're running Google campaigns on Google Search Network, or even the display network, you have access to a great tool called Keyboard Planner. And if you know anything about SEO, you'll know that using Google's Keyword Planner is a good tool. So we'll take a look at that. Moz is a freemium tool, meaning they have a free trial that you can sign up for to test drive it, but it's another SEO platform and it does cost money. Got a great tool in Screaming Frog, that's a paid version. Again, not too expensive. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And then we have you know, a tool in Ahrefs that help us with all aspects of SEO, primarily focusing on off-page. So these are just some examples that we're gonna hone in on, but this is just a small subset of what really is available out there in the market. So let's go ahead and dive a little bit deeper and understand why we use some of these tools. Well. The first reason when we talk about SEO is to find relevant keywords. Not only do we want to find relevant keywords, we want to find relevant keywords with high volume and low competition. Okay, we wouldn't want to find non-relevant keywords with high competition, low volume, that wouldn't make sense. So we need a tool to kind of help us put it all together. And so the tool of choice for us is Google's Keyword Planner. And Google's Keyword Planner helps us hone in on keywords we may be interested in optimizing for because not only one, are they relevant, but two, they're gonna have high volume and low competition. So let's take a look at an example in Google's Keyword Planner. So here I am, I'm in Google's Keyword Planner and as I mentioned before, Google's Keyword Planner is situated under Google Ads. 
Okay, so you have to have a Google Ads account to use Google's Keyword Planner. And so when you're in Google Ads, you simply go to Tools, and then under Tools, you're gonna to select Keyword Planner. So what we wanna do is look for keywords. We're focusing on organic search, not necessarily paid search. So organic search, we want to hone in on some keywords. So let's just use one of the examples that Google's given us here, meal delivery. So we're gonna just type in meal delivery and get some results. So notice I can enter a domain as a filter. And so in other words, hey, I could say, look, hone in on keywords related to this website if I wanted to. But I'm asking Google, hey, just give me something closely related to mail delivery because that's my business. So I'm going to click, click get results. Notice I can add another keyword if I wanted to, but I'm just going to stick with one keyword. But there are certainly other keywords that I can certainly hone in on if mail delivery is my business and so let's just hone in on that one keyword mail delivery we want to be found organically for that keyword so what google keyword planner does is not only give us the keyword and other keywords relevant to that but it gives us the average monthly search volumes and this is an average over the course of the last 12 months and notice here i get a column for competition so I'm able to see whether that's a very competitive keyword or not. And then just to give you an extra edge when you're choosing keywords, you can get a sense of what the keyword may cost if you wanted to bid on that for paid search. So for mail delivery, I can see it's anywhere between $7.46 and at the top of the page, high range, $16.61. So that should alert me to the fact that, hey, if I'm going to, try and optimize for this keyword i know it's competitive because not only google is telling me it's competitive by telling me high competition but i know that the cost per click seems a little bit high and what is a little bit high well you know i could see some other keywords here that you know a dollar to three dollars okay i could see some other ones that are even lower than the seven dollars they're suggesting so that's an indication that the keyword is highly competitive. So the idea here using Google's Keyword Planner is one, we want to get an idea of what other keywords are out there that are relevant. So it helps stimulate some ideas for relevancy. Two, we can get an average monthly search volume. So we want to know on average over the past 12 months, how many search queries I can expect from this keyword. And then three, I can get a sense of the competition. How competitive is this keyword? So if I try to optimize for this keyword and I want to rank for it organically, is it competitive? If it's competitive, then it's probably going to take me a bit longer to be found for this keyword on page one of Google. So that's the whole idea behind Google's Keyword Planner. And note that you could change some of the settings here. So if you want to choose a different language, okay, you can hone in on a longer or shorter period of time. You can even choose a specific location. So I chose Texas. I can certainly choose the entire United States to get a sense of what the volume would be for the total US. So you have settings that you can change and manipulate to get you the data you need to choose keywords. So that's the whole idea behind Google's Keyword Planner to find relevant keywords high volume, low competition. Now, alternatively, I can certainly use another tool to find keywords. So I have a Moz account, so I logged into Moz. And Moz has a tool called Keyword Explorer. So if I use that same keyword I used in Google's Keyword Planner, Mail Delivery, I'm gonna ask Moz to give me some data on that keyword. So this is for the entire United States. And again, I can change that if I wanted to. Okay, so I can hone in on a specific country or different country. So what Moz is telling me, hey, for this keyword in the entire United States, I'm looking at anywhere from 11,500 to 30,000 on monthly volume. Now what Moz does is they give you a difficulty score. So a difficulty score is a score between one and 100. And so I could see this is pretty much right down the middle in terms of difficulty. Okay, so if it's zero, it's an easy keyword. If it's, an, if it's 100, it's very difficult. And then that means you have a lot of competitors who are optimizing for this keyword that are ranking for this keyword. And so 
Moz gives us the volume, they give us the competition, and they, just like Google's Keyword Planner, gives us some other keywords that we can potentially hone in on. So here I could see keyword delivery plans, delivery services, etc. So I can see a lot more suggestions than what's listed here. So Moz delivers a bunch of other analysis uh, related to the keyword. You know, they also give you some good keyword suggestions. So Moz is a good alternative tool and we'll be coming back to Moz related to SEO for some other of its features. But for now, if you don't want to necessarily use Google's Keyword Planner because maybe you're not running Google Ads, you can always use Moz. Now remember Moz has basically a freemium version, meaning you can sign up for a free account. And you can sign up for a free account as a test trial and you can test it for a period of days and leverage its tools during that free trial to get a better sense of how these tools work. So we want to be able to use Moz. We want to be able to use Google's Keyword Planner, not only to search for all those relevant keywords available to you, but we want to be able to choose keywords with high volume and low difficulty, low competition. We also want to select primary and second keywords wisely. So remember when you optimize, you're optimizing a page for more than one keyword. So you want to be able to have a nice portfolio of diverse relevant keywords with high search volume and low difficulty. And then you want to be able to identify those keywords that your competitors are ranking for. So Moz gives you that information. And so we want to be able to leverage the tools available to us to choose the right keywords. So if you need any more information on this, we got a nice webinar on keyword research for SEO. So take a look at that video on YouTube uh, to get more specific details about using SEO tools for keyword research and all about keyword research in general for SEO. So let's talk about some other reasons under SEO why we would use some of these tools available to us. Well, we want to be able to understand the search engines and how they crawl and index our site. Okay, we also want to check the correct format of the sitemap and we want to monitor backlinks. Okay, we also want to analyze linking to our web page. Okay, which ones are good, which ones are not good. Okay, we also want to perform some competitor analysis. So these are some of the reasons why, other than keyword research, why would we use some of these SEO tools? So we have tools available to us, Majestic, Ahrefs, again, Moz. Let's take a look at Google Search Console. And I want to hone in on Google Search Console because it is free and it's a must. If you're going to work on SEO, you need to be working in Google Search Console. And so the whole key behind Google Search Console is you have a website and you need to get that site verified. Once it's verified, once Google can recognize that you are associated with this website, then you're going to be able to see some important information. So here I'm looking at a website and what am I looking at? I'm looking at something called coverage under index. So what does coverage mean? Well, going back to what we just said, we want to be able to understand how Google's crawling and indexing our pages. And so what Google does is through this platform search console is they're letting us know once they go to our website and start crawling it and they pull these pages back to their server, they're letting us know if we actually have any issues. So here I could see I have some issues with 112 pages and some of those issues are listed down here. So there could be a crawl issue, a 404, you know, a redirect. Okay. So you could see there's some five unique issues across 112 pages. So here I could see submitted URL marked no index. There's a hundred of those pages. We have some redirect errors. There's seven pages that, you know, fall victim to this error. And so we can really hone in um, what the error is and address the error. Okay. So if Google's telling us, Hey, this is an issue and you want that page indexed by Google, then we should probably address the error. And so that's the great thing here about going into Google search console is you can under index, go to coverage and get a sense of what Google's indexing and what they're not indexing. Okay, so these are the errors I could see. They've certainly were able to crawl and index 9,115 
pages uh, they were able to crawl okay and they excluded 54,000 plus pages and then we also have some pages with some warnings so this is kind of an overview of what Google sees when they crawl our site so when they say crawl they're coming to our site they're following links on the site and every link they follow they're either going to index that page or they're going to report to you an error or an issue that they found if we want these pages indexed we need to address the issues the errors and so that's the beauty of this report here is Google is telling us firsthand what the issues are so we also want to take a look at the sitemap so you have an opportunity to submit a sitemap and a sitemap is just a formatted file that includes all your website URLs and so you're going to have this file sitting in your root directory and you're probably going to call it or should call it sitemap.xml xml being the format so once you have this file you're just going to let Google know that that file exists so you're going to enter in the sitemap URL so if it's in the root directory all you're going to do is type in sitemap.xml and click submit so once you've done it just like this site is done what Google's going to do is say hey look we see you've submitted this and we last read it a couple days ago and we could see that we discovered 1419 URLs so I can go back under coverage and I can see some of the issues that they found but if I go back under sitemaps I can see that these are the URLs they discovered via the sitemap and so the whole point of a sitemap is we want to be able to get and push the URLs to Google not have Google come to our site and discover them so this is a quicker faster more efficient way to communicate with Google all the URLs that you have on your site that you want Google to index and so that's the beauty of search console now while we're in search console we might as well take a look at some of the other features it has and so one of the most important features under search console is this mobile usability report Okay, so Google is a staunch believer in mobile first so nowadays most people start and finish a lot of their searches a lot of their behavior on mobile so they begin it on mobile and they may end it on mobile so if they don't end it on mobile then you know perhaps they'll go into a store or perhaps they'll go via desktop but Google is a staunch believer in definitely a lot of what's going on today starts with mobile so they want you to understand how your site fares via mobile and when I say fares via mobile is it mobile friendly is it responsive is it loading quick enough you know is it formatted to Google standards and so if there are any issues Google's gonna let you know what those issues are so here I could see Google's recognized 206 pages with four different issues okay so here I can see what those issues are just like the coverage issues we can see specifically what they are and so here I could see for 206 pages text too small to read click elements too close together the viewport not set to device width, and then content wider than the screen so there's 10 pages that fit under this error and if I actually click on it the error I can see what those 10 pages are and so when we're done we can actually when we address the issues we can actually have Google validate whether the fix has been made so you can definitely use this as a means of communicating directly with Google telling Google look I see what the issues are I'm gonna fix them and then I want you to validate them okay so this is important because if you can communicate with Google and let them know hey we do recognize the errors we are fixing the errors please validate them you know it's going to draw Google's attention Google's going to validate them and get these pages indexed quicker um, so if you ignore the issues and the errors especially for mobile then you stand the chance of your pages not getting indexed so the mobile usability report to me is an important report because we want to better understand whether Google's picking up issues on mobile and if they are we want to address them get Google to validate them so Google can index them quicker now there's another report that is of interest to you or may be of interest to you in Google Search Console and that's the links report so the links report in Google Search Console tells us what pages have the most links 
Okay, so here we can see the home page has 26,000 plus links. If we hone in on interior pages, we can see the links to those pages. Okay, so we can get a sense of what are the top link pages from external links, meaning links on other websites pointing to these pages. I can also see internal links. So Google is recognizing links from within my website from one page to another. So external links, internal links, both factors for SEO when ranking. So then I could see top linking sites, what sites are linking to my site. And then I could see top linking text. So Google Search Console has given me kind of an overview of what my linking structure looks like. Okay, so externally, I want links from other websites pointing to various pages on my site. And I certainly want my pages linking to one another on my site. And so I'd be able to better understand what that structure looks like using Google Search Console's links report. Okay, there's one more report that I think is of interest in Google Search Console, and that's the performance report. So the performance report is a report that actually you can link up with Google Analytics. So you could see the same report in Analytics if you're able to link up Google Search Console with Analytics. And you should be able to do that. All you need to do is make sure you use the same email address that you use for Analytics and Search Console. So it needs to be the same email address. You could certainly link up the two and have this data imported into Google Analytics. So what is this data that we're talking about? Well, it's called performance. So what we can actually see is the queries, the actual queries people are typing in to Google. So when they're typing them into Google, we can actually see how many impressions the keyword queries received and how many clicks the keyword queries received. And then I can see click through rate and average position. Okay, so here I can see for this particular keyword on the first line, I could see over the course of the last three months, it received 209,297 impressions. So what does that mean? That means this keyword was used at least, or typed in as a query at least that many times. And that's how many times my listing appeared in the Google search results pages based on this particular query. And so as a result, of somebody typing in this query 209,000 plus times, this site received 120,000 plus clicks. So to get a sense of the click-through rate, all you would need to do, and Google can obviously do this for you, is you would simply just divide the 209,297 into the 120,397. Okay, so that's really gonna give you, that's gonna give you a click-through rate, and the click-through rate in this case is 57%. So over half of the clicks occur when this listing appears for this keyword. Okay, so we can get a sense of the click through rate for each one. Okay, and you could simply just use the filtering here. Now we can also see average position. Okay, so we could see a little bit more than that too. We can go from queries to pages, we can go from pages to countries, so we can get a sense of how many impressions and clicks I'm receiving by country and importantly we can see by device. So here I can see a majority of the people who conduct a search related to my website primarily do it on desktop. Now I mentioned the beauty of the Google Search Console performance report is that you can link it up to Google Analytics and when you do that all you need to do then is go to acquisition Google Search Console and then from there you could choose landing pages, countries, devices, or queries. So I could see the same data that I see in Search Console, but this time I'm looking at it in Google Analytics. And so here I can see what my search queries are, my clicks, my impressions, my click through rate, by search query, and then the average position. So that's the great thing about that performance report is that when I link up Google Search Console with Analytics, I'm able to see that data in Analytics. So that's an added bonus, so to speak. Now, let's talk about some other reasons why we're going to use these SEO tools available to us. And so we already listed a number of different reasons ranging from sitemaps to keyword research. But we also want to hone in on you know, what domains are driving links to our site. So I showed you an example in Search Console. We also want to 
hey, maybe identify and disavow poor backlinks. So Search Console is a great tool for that because if we don't want to be associated with a particular website, we can certainly disavow that link. We could track a number of follow and no follow links. Okay, we could track our website's rankings. We can measure click-through rates and impressions just as we did with Search Console. We could track keyword ranking for desktop, mobile, cross locations just as we just did with the Search Console performance report. We can identify top performing, gaining, and losing keywords. Again, the performance report. So we could certainly look at the Google Search Console report, but if you have a platform like Moz, you can certainly also look at a lot of that data available. So for example, rankings. So if you have a Moz account, we can certainly go into rankings. Okay, and we can see for the keywords that we've chosen that we want to optimize for, we could certainly see where they rank. The great thing about Moz is it's a great tool, not only for rankings and on-page optimization, but for off-page optimization as well. So if I go ahead and take a look at a domain, for example, I'm just going to type in this domain. I'm going to be able to get what they call a domain authority. So a score out of one in 100, I'm able to see how authoritative my domain is. And how authoritative a domain is is based on the quality of links pointing to it. So Moz gives me some good insights as to how many linking domains, how many inbound links I have, ranking keywords, and it goes into detail as well. So here, if I click on the linking domains, I'm going to be actual able to see the actual domains pointing to my site as an external link. And not only can I see the domains, I can actually see the domain authority of those domains. So if there's a domain, for example, that doesn't have a good domain authority and the site appears a bit scammy per se, then we can disavow that. So I can certainly look at all the domains that are linking to me and then I can highlight the ones that have poor domain authority. What Moz even takes it a step further. They also give me a spam score. So Moz is able to measure how spammy a website is. So if I have a combination of say a low domain authority and a high spam score, then I probably want to disavow myself from that site. And so I can use this report here. You can see here as I keep going down, for example, I could see this particular website has a domain authority of 26 and it has a spam score of 16%. So not a good combination. This should alert me to the fact that, hey, this particular site, because it has so many links pointing to me or it has at least one link pointing to me that I probably want to disavow myself because it's probably hurting my own domain authority. So that's the great thing about this linking domains report is I'm able to hone in on not only who's link linking to me, meaning domain, but how many linking domains does that domain have? What's the spam score of that domain? What's the domain authority of that domain? And then I can get into a little bit more detail and actually see, you know, all the links pointing to that domain. So it really goes into detail about backlinks, domain authority, spam, et cetera, everything you need to use in order to measure off page SEO. So that's the great thing about Moz is they have not only on page SEO tools, but off page SEO tools. And Moz is a freemium, so to speak. So here you can see if you just go to moz.com slash free dash SEO dash tools, you'll be able to use some of these tools available to you, not just for SEO, but also for local SEO as well. So here you like some of these tools, you can start your free 30 day trial. So I use and lean on Moz a lot for all that it has to offer from choosing keywords to rankings report, to checking issues on my website, to even checking who's linking to me. So this fits in the mold with everything I need to do for SEO. So in addition to that keyword research video, you could certainly lean on some other webinars that we've done in the past on SEO. So we've done a webinar on SEO tools, and we've also done a webinar on SEO tips and tricks. So if you want any more information about the tools we covered or SEO in general, take a look at those two videos and check them out 
and that should kind of complement what we talked about with using some of the tools, Google's Keyword Planner, uh, Moz, and Google Search Console. Okay, let's switch over to email marketing tools. And so with email marketing tools, we have a lot available to us in the form of reporting, in the form of platforms, in the form of you know tools that really help us go from A to Z on our email, choosing you know what email to send out, to creating a list, to measuring how the email campaign went. And so we could start with MailChimp because MailChimp's a freemium version. When we say freemium, meaning they have a free trial available, then you're expected to upgrade. But you know, MailChimp to me is a tool I use. I like the interface, very easy for beginners. So we're gonna take a look at MailChimp, but there are certainly many others available. You know, Marketo is a good tool. You know, Marketo is a good tool because if you have a business and you're trying to funnel people through your pipeline, so to speak, meaning they, they sign up as a lead and you wanna nurture that lead from the beginning to the end, meaning at the end, they're actually going to turn around and purchase. Well, Marketo is a good tool for you to use because you can then set up drip campaigns or also known as email campaigns, you know, so that you're talking and communicating with that particular prospect through every point in the funnel. So that's the great thing about Marketo. It has drip campaigns available along with some other features. There's HubSpot, it's a very powerful tool. It does a lot from creating landing pages to A-B testing to social to you know email. So this is another freemium tool that you could use. You have another freemium and send in blue email platform, and then you also have ConvertKit, another email platform. And you, there's more dimension that we can't even fit on this screen. Now, if you have a favorite email marketing tool that you use, Constant Contact, Vertical Response, there are plenty out there. Emma, you know, feel free to, to note that in the comment section below this video. I'm curious as to how many people actually use, you know, different tools because there are so literally so many email marketing tools out there. Why? Because email marketing has been around probably the longest amongst all the other digital marketing channels. And a lot of people use email on a, on a daily basis. So it's no wonder why there's just so many tools available. And so with these tools, you could certainly send bulk emails. Now, in the case of Marketo, you could send emails to a segmented audience. And so that's a, actually what you want to do as a strategy is always send emails to a segmented audience. You know, you want to use a tool where you're going to be able to create campaigns, then send those campaigns to, again, segmented contacts, and then be able to design your email around that particular audience. So you know you have a good tool when you can do that, when you can really segment for your audience. Okay, you want to be able to Use a tool that's going to be able to segment your users, you know, use transactional emails, meaning, hey, look, if somebody go ahead, went ahead and purchased, can you follow up with an email? And creating workflows, just like I mentioned with Marketo, you want a workflow set up where, hey, if somebody does this, you're sending email B, et cetera. So you want an email marketing tool that's flexible enough to handle what your business strategy and goals are. Okay, so you want to be able to also use a tool that, you know, has various email templates available. Okay, you don't want to be stuck with just a vanilla template. Again, you want to be able to customize an email for your audience. You want to be able to manage your list appropriately, meaning if you have 10,000 users or emails in a list, you want to be able to manage them accordingly you know, break them up or, or have sub lists, so to speak. And then most importantly, you want to make sure you have a platform that not only does its tracking on its own, but will give you some detailed insights, meaning, you know, what percentage of users opened your email, what percentage of, of recipients clicked on your email, what links do they click on, you know, which, which emails bounce. So you want some detailed insights right in the platform that you're using. It just makes it more simpler and easier and more effective to manage. You certainly want to create those smart automated campaigns, meaning you don't even have to send out the email. And then you want to be able to have some flexibility to set up email delivery based on a specific time and day. So these tools also allow you to 
your segment contacts based on geolocation. You want to be able to use a tool that allows for multivariate testing. Again, you want to analyze performance and optimize campaigns. You want to trigger automatic responses. Somebody purchases something, are you using a tool that will automatically send that email out? So these are all the reasons why you would use an email marketing tool. So let's dive in and take a look at an example. And we're going to use MailChimp as our example today. So let's dive in and take a look at MailChimp. So with MailChimp, once you log in, you know, you're going to be able to see some historical campaigns that you sent out, or you're going to be able to create your own campaign. And so this is kind of under campaigns, you can kind of see an overview of the ones you've sent out, or if they're in draft mode, you'll be able to see they're in draft mode. So you can go ahead and edit them. So here we have one that was set up on August 26th and it's still in draft mode. So we can go ahead and edit that. So if we just click edit, you know, we have the flexibility to, you know, pick and choose who we're sending this to, who it's from, what the subject line is. And then we can certainly design the email. So if we click design email, again, this is important because with email marketing, you want to be able to cater your email to your intended audience. So if you're selling men's shoes, your audience should be men. Okay. So you don't want men to receive an email about women's shoes. It sounds like it's common sense, but the point being, you want to be able to use an email platform that's going to be able to allow you to put two and two together. The message and the design with the intended audience. And so here you can see MailChimp allows us to do that. Okay, you can see some of the layouts here. Okay, you also have themes that you could choose from. Okay, you could search for different themes or you can even just code your own. So you can just paste your code in or you can import it. So MailChimp allows that flexibility. You're not stuck with one of their templates. And so if we go back to the dashboard, the one thing I like about MailChimp though is the reporting. Okay. So yes, it is easy to choose a template and map that template to your audience, but I really like the reports that they have to offer. So, you know, here you can see there's some lists that we've sent to and we choose one of our audience list then we can see some really detailed reporting here. And so here I could see this email that was sent out in June. I could see it was sent to 95,000 plus subscribers. Okay, of the subscribers, I saw 2,000 plus open it and 157 clicks. So I can view this report in more detail just by clicking on view report. So again, we want an email platform that's going to be able to give us some detailed information about how that email campaign performed. And so I can get down really to the nitty gritty. I can actually see, you know, on the content, what was clicked and what wasn't clicked. So here I sent two different subject lines. So I'm able to compare the two against one another. Okay. So I can really go into detail about one of them here. So if I click view report, I can specifically see what the average for this list is. So here I'm able to compare against the list average and it's 16%. I only had an open rate of 2.5%. So the industry average is 18%. And so here I'm able to see the list average for the click rate and the industry average for the click rate as well. So then I can see some specifics about it, how many people unsubscribed. Then I could see a graph, I could see the top links that were clicked, okay, the top subscribers with the most opens. I can link social to it if I want to, and then I can see geographic information. So the point being is MailChimp really goes into some nice detail here about the email campaigns and how they performed. So the great thing is too, with the MailChimp, you can link it with Google Analytics. You can link it with e-commerce. Okay, so if you have an email and you're, you're selling products and somebody purchased that product, MailChimp is able to integrate in with your shopping commerce platform. For example, WooCommerce. So if somebody did purchase, you can send out that thank you email. MailChimp even goes a step further and if somebody did click on a link, go to your shopping cart, add something to the shopping cart, and then abandon the cart, you know, MailChimp allows you the opportunity to retarget them via email. 
So MailChimp is flexible and that's what you want in a email marketing platform. You want something that's flexible that you can cater to your audience. You can manage your audience list and you can get detailed reporting on your different campaigns for that audience. So that's MailChimp in summary. And so most email platforms do a lot of the similar features or have some of the similar features, but that's what you ideally want to look for in an email marketing platform. So here's a tool that doesn't get talked about enough when it comes to email marketing, and that's Google's URL builder. And the reason why we're going to talk about this tool today is because most people in the US use Google Analytics as their web analytics tool. And the one thing about Google Analytics is it allows you to track different campaigns. So if you're doing pay-per-click campaigns outside of Google, you can certainly track the performance right in Google Analytics. And email is no different. So if you're using Google Analytics and you're sending out an email, let's just say on MailChimp or any other email marketing platform, you want to be able to append your links with what we call UTM tracking. So for example, if I have a URL that says visit Florida and I'm going to send out an email, I have up to five parameters that I can use. Okay, so here's my email or URL that I'm using in the email. So I have up to five parameters that I can use to track this particular email. So let's go through some of those parameters. So the first one is campaign source. So what's the source of the campaign? Well, we could certainly identify MailChimp if we're using MailChimp as the source. Now the the thing about the URL builders, you always want to use lowercase because Google Analytics is case sensitive. So as a rule of thumb, just stick with a lowercase. So our source is going to be MailChimp because that's the platform we're using. If you're using, you know, constant contact or vertical response or, you know, some of these other ones, ConvertKit, then go ahead and put in that platform as the source. Now for the medium, which is the means in which we're driving traffic to the site, Let's go ahead and put in email because that's what we're using to drive traffic to this particular page. Now, what's the campaign name? Well, we're in summer, so we're going to call this the summer promo. So the summer promo here is visit Florida beaches. Okay, so we're going to send this email out to the masses and particularly not only the masses, but the masses in the north because we're going to say, hey, look, come to Florida for the summer. Come visit our beaches. That's the point of the campaign. So that's what we're going to use for the campaign name is whatever the campaign is. It's a summer promo. Now, notice I got an asterisk next to these particular parameters. So Google's asking us, hey, these are mandatory. So go ahead and put something in there. Now for campaign term and campaign content, we could certainly leave them blank because they're not mandatory. But since we're talking about email, I would certainly recommend that you use the campaign content parameter. And why do I say that? Because if we're sending an email out to say you have 10,000 recipients, I want to be able to split out the email into two segments. One segment that's going to get subject line one and one segment that's going to get subject line two. So in this case, I'm going to put whatever subject line one is in the campaign content field. So now I have four parameters and once I've entered in my variables in those parameter fields, I now have a revised or appended URL. So my original URL was visitflorida.com slash en-us slash florida-beaches.html. My original URL, I've now appended that with some UTM parameters. And now I see my original URL appended with the UTM parameters based on those variables. So I can copy it just by clicking the copy URL. I can go to my browser. I can paste that URL in there. And I want to check to see if it works. So here I could see this particular page loaded, Florida beaches with my UTM parameters appended to the URL. So that's for the first subject line. That's for the audience that's going to get the first subject line. I want to do another one for the second subject line. So now I'm going to change my campaign content parameter to subject line underscore two. I'm going to copy that URL. I'm going to check it. 
Okay, so I can see that the page loads with those UTM parameters. And so now what am I gonna do? I'm gonna use the first URL and the second URL in my email. Okay, so any link that I have, in this case, I'm using subject line two. So for the email with the su second subject line going to that segmented audience, this is the link I'm gonna use in the email. So if you have one or two or three links in the email, this is the URL you're going to use. Because when somebody clicks on that link, you're gonna be able to see that, that click in Google Analytics. So if I jump over to Google Analytics, after I sent out my email, I'm gonna to go to acquisition, I'm gonna to go to campaigns, I'm gonna to go to all campaigns. Now based on the variables I put into my parameters, meaning source, medium, campaign name, content, or term, that's what I'm gonna look for in Google Analytics. So we could start with source and medium, so if I click on source and medium as my primary dimension, here I can see MailChimp and the actual date was used as part of the variable for, for source. And then I will, can I see the medium being email? So now I can see for this email that was sent out in MailChimp in May, I could see how many users, how many sessions, and more importantly, how many conversions. So we could certainly hone in on that particular email if we wanted to. If we choose some of the other parameters available to us, so here I could see the campaign name. Okay, so I could see exactly what campaign, what source, what email drove in traffic and conversions. And if I'm doing subject line testing, I can choose content as my parameter. So here I'm going to change it to content. And now I could see the subject lines in this case. If I go back to my source medium, I'm gonna be able to see what subject lines from my emails generated the most traffic. And not only the most traffic, but also conversions. So that's the whole point behind using the URL builder. Again, you're taking a URL that you're going to use an email, and then you're going to pen that URL with different parameters. Campaign source, campaign medium, campaign name, and then optionally campaign content or campaign term. Okay, once you've entered variables into those parameters, you're gonna get an appended URL, which you can then use in your email. So when the email gets sent, you're gonna go back over to Google Analytics and you're going to look at the results of that campaign of that source, of that medium, of that content, i.e. subject line. And so that's why the URL builder is so important because MailChimp gives us some good insight as to how the email performed in terms of open and click rates. But what we really want to see is how that campaign performed once it drove traffic to my website. So that's the whole idea behind the URL builder. If you're using Google Analytics, you'll be able to use the URL builder with whatever email platform you're using. So let's move on to web analytics tools. And this is an important section because web analytics tools, kind of the central focal point of all digital marketing. And it starts really with Google Analytics. Google Analytics is a freemium, meaning that they have a free version that you can use. There is also a paid version of Google Analytics. But given the advent of Google, its popularity, especially in the United States, a majority of users are using the free version of Google Analytics. So it's a very popular tool, especially for marketers. But there are also other tools available. So it's not just Google. So we have Adobe Analytics, which is also freemium. You have Kiss Metrics. You have Spring Metrics. You have YouTube Analytics, which is part of Google, but YouTube has its own separate analytics insights. So a lot of these, as you can see, are free to use. They're available. No reason why you should not be using uh, an analytics tool to measure your marketing campaigns or website behavior. And why would we want to use these tools again? Well, 
Again, we want to really measure behavior. We want to measure what's going on with our website. So we want to be able to identify the location of where our website visitors are coming from. And a lot of these analytics tools use IP address to identify the location of a website visitor. So if you're trying to target a specific country, then you want to be able to see that the visitors to your website are coming from that specific country or location. We also want to measure the engagement of our website behavior. So we get traffic to the website. What are they doing? How long are they staying? What pages are they visiting? So this is the overall nature of really why we want to use Web Analytics to, to measure how successful our website is at treating our website visitors with the same courtesy you would if you had a brick and mortar store. Somebody comes into your store, you want them to find what they're looking for quickly. You want them to be happy with their experience. You certainly want them to pay for the products very quickly and easily and efficiently. And you want them to come back. And that's no different than a website. So we want our website to perform in a manner that's going to suit our audience. And that's why we want to track engagement. So why else? Well, we want to really look at who's coming. Are they returning visitors or new visitors? You know, ideally you want a nice mix between 50% new and 50% returning because you know returning visitors are loyal. There's some loyalty to that. They already know your brand. They're coming back to your website. New visitors are curious and you want new visitors because that means more traffic. So you want a nice balance between that. Analytics tools will help you measure that. You want to be able to measure organic traffic. Whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, but Google and other search engines are indexing your pages and your pages are being found via the search engines. And so you want to be able to measure how much traffic you're actually generating from those search engines. We talked about this with email marketing, UTM tracking. So if you set up email campaigns or non-Google campaigns, you want to use UTM tracking and Google Analytics and other analytics tools, but specifically Google Analytics will help you see the results of your campaigns if they're tracked with UTM tracking. So that's another good reason why to use a web analytics tool. Probably most importantly amongst all these bullet points is our goals, our website conversions. We want to be able to see how much traffic is coming to our website and not only the engagement of the traffic, but how much of that traffic is actually doing what we want them to do, i.e. are they converting? And we want to optimize our sites and channels performance. So the whole idea of collecting all this information is that you can turn around and improve performance. So if your bounce rate is high, well, how do you lower bounce rate? Well, we need to do something about that. And analytics tools will help us identify what's not working from our site perspective and from a channel perspective, and we can take action to improve performance. So that's the whole idea behind optimizing our site's performance. So let's jump into Google Analytics and let's take a look at everything we just talked about in those bullet points so about improving website performance measuring engagement looking at our goals and conversions measuring campaigns with utm tracking all those good things that we can get in a good analytics tool so adobe mix panel spring metrics you know they all work in a similar fashion in that they're really measuring website behavior and so if we're in google analytics really what we're doing is we're measuring the performance of our website broken down into four components, audience, acquisition, behavior, and conversions. So what do we want to do? Well, we want to look into each one of these sections. So let's start with audience. And so audience in Google Analytics tells us who is coming to our website. Now, they're not going to specifically tell us, hey, Rob Sanders came to your website but they are gonna say that somebody from San Francisco, California came to the website. And these are the pages they looked at. And this is the language. And they came from this device. And they're a returning user. So they're painting a picture for you. Okay, so they're not giving you a list of names. That would not be legal, but they are providing you with a good picture of who is coming. 
And when I say picture, we have to paint that picture. And so if we look at, say, demographics, for example, and I go to demographics overview, here's a picture I'm painting. Well, I can see that 25 to 34 year olds are the majority of the age group that is coming to my website. Okay, I can see on the gender side of it, I can see that 63% of my traffic, and again, this is year to date that I'm looking at, is coming to my website. So two thirds of my traffic is female, one third male. And they're between the ages of 25 and 34. So I'm painting a picture about, you know, gender and age coming to my website. Well, I can also look at geo. So where specifically might these people be coming from? So if I go to location under geo, I'm gonna be able to see a breakdown of country or I can even hone it down to city, or specific location and here I could see United States is the primary driver but not by much so we have 16 almost 17 percent from the US and then 16 percent from Argentina 13 percent from Mexico 10 percent from India so we have a nice mix of traffic from different locations in the world coming to our website so that's geo but more importantly let's take a look at mobile so if we go to mobile overview, how are people coming to our website? Are they on a desktop or laptop? Are they using their mobile device? Are they using a tablet? And so Google Analytics breaks it down very nice for you. And so we could see percentages and actual numbers by device category. And so in this case, I could see year to date, I could see 62% are coming from desktop, 35% are coming from mobile and so that's important because most people start their journey from mobile and that is growing and that's going to continue to grow so you want to keep an eye on mobile so to me this is one of the more important reports under audience because people who come from mobile have a different not only experience because the website should be responsive to the mobile device but their mindset is gonna be different. They're actively looking for something. They're probably going to either then follow up on their desktop or follow up in person at your store. Or they're probably looking for directions or they may just call you. So the experience is a lot different on mobile. So we wanna hone in on the growth of mobile. Okay, so to me, this is one of the more important reports in Google Analytics, especially under audience. So let's move on to acquisition. So acquisition reporting tells us how the traffic was driven to the website. So if audience tells us who is coming to the website, acquisition tells us how that traffic got to the website. And so really what you want to do is get a sense of what channels, what marketing channels are driving traffic. So Remember we talked about organic search. Well, those search engines are indexing your pages. Well, how much of that traffic from the search engines is actually coming to your site? And I'm a believer in if organic search is the primary driver of traffic, then you have a pretty healthy website because that means the search engines are indexing your pages. People are searching for something related to your business. You're being found, you're getting clicked, and that represents a majority of the traffic. So that's always a good thing. So here we could see it broken down by channel. If I go to all traffic channels report, I can see in my dimension that organic search represents 72% of my traffic. And this is year to date. Then I can see paid search. Then I can see direct, which means somebody went directly to the site. I could see referral, email, social. Then I could see more paid search broken out. So these are the different marketing channels. Now, analytics allows you to look at a specific source and medium. So the source would be the actual website or search engine. And the medium would differentiate how that traffic actually got to the site. So if we're talking about a search engine, did they come to the site via paid search or did they come to the site via organic search? And so all we need to do is change our primary dimension from default channel grouping to source and medium and we could see specifically the breakout of the different sources and mediums driving traffic to the site so here i can see google organic at 71 percent and then google cpc or cost per click at 15 16 percent of our traffic 
So then I can look down, I could see email in here, Bing organic, I could see some referring sites, I could see some social in terms of mobile Facebook. Okay, so we could see a mix of the different sources and mediums driving traffic to the site. Okay, so you don't always have to look at channel per se, you can look at it via source and medium. And if you're running Google Ads, under acquisition, analytics has a whole section of Google Ads reporting. So if you're running campaigns on Google Ads, remember we looked at the keyword planner in Google Ads. So if you're running campaigns on Google Ads, you can certainly see the performance of those campaigns just by clicking on campaigns. We can also see campaigns, other campaigns that we're running. So remember that UTM tracking that we set up for email. Well, we want to be able to track the performance of email and any other non Google campaign with UTM tracking. So when we do that, we'll be able to go to campaigns, all campaigns, and we'll be able to see the campaign performance. If we look at source and medium, we'll be able to see what campaigns drove traffic to the website. So here I can see vertical response email as a driver of traffic. So, that's the campaign reporting. And then also if you have Search Console. So we looked at Search Console earlier when we talked about SEO tools. Well, remember I said you can link up Search Console with Google Analytics. Well, here's Search Console and we could see queries, devices, landing pages, countries. So all the performance metrics that we could see in Search Console, because we have it linked up with analytics, we could see it right here. So. This gives us a nice snapshot of what keywords are driving traffic to the site organically. I could see the impressions, I could see the clicks, then I could see the click through rate, and then the average position. So in theory, the higher something ranks, the more traffic you're gonna get. So that's the idea behind it. We wanna make sure that we're ranking for our coveted keywords, and if we are, we want to be able to measure how many times our listing was seen and how many times it was clicked. So that's the great thing about, you know, Google, they have a family of products and those products tend to talk to one another in the form of Google search console and Google ads. You can connect them directly to Google analytics. So let's move from acquisition to behavior. So here in behavior, we have a number of different reports. So behavior tells us, once the traffic actually arrived at the website, how are they behaving? And so really what I would do is from there, go to site content, all pages. And so this gives us an idea of how many pages were actually viewed. So site content, all pages tells us what page and how many times it was viewed during a period of time. And again, we're looking at year to date. So I can see engagement related metrics associated with a page. So this particular page here on line one, I could see how many page views, unique page views, which is equal to sessions. So I can have a session come to the website and look at a page multiple times in that session. I could see the average time the person has spent on a page and I can also see the bounce rate. So a bounce rate indicates that they arrived on the page and didn't go any further. They left the website from that page that they arrived on. And so I can also see percentage of exits, meaning what page did people exit the site from? So these are all engagement related metrics. So here is where I want to react and optimize my website performance. So I, if I see a page not performing well, meaning it has a high bounce rate or maybe low time on page, then I'm probably going to optimize it, meaning test it or change it to improve performance. So these are all pages, but I could certainly look at landing pages. Okay, so landing pages tells us the behavior of the page when somebody landed on it. So a landing page means that somebody came from organic search or paid search or another channel landed on this page. So here I could see this particular page on line one had 4,970 sessions, okay? And I can also see the performance of that page. So measuring engagements against pages is definitely important because page isn't performing in terms of bounce rate or time on page, then we wanna be able to make changes to that page to improve performance. 
Okay, there are some other great reports under behavior. So we want to go to site speed. We want to look at how fast or how slow our pages load. So this is important from an SEO perspective because if a page isn't loading very fast, then chances of it getting ranked in Google are not very good. So Google's organic search basically takes page load time seriously. So if a page doesn't load very fast, then we need to be able to fix it. So we can go to page timings. I can get a good sense of the average page load time of a particular page. And what Google does here is under speed suggestions, they actually will give me some ideas and speed suggestions on how to address a page that's loading very slow. And so when we load up the speed suggestions report, what Google does is say, hey, we know that this page is loading very slow. The average page load time is 15 seconds. Here's some suggestions. We're going to give you seven suggestions. So if you click on that, what's actually going to happen is you're going to go to another tool called PageSpeed Insights. And PageSpeed Insights is analyzing the page, as you can see here. And when it's done analyzing the page, it's going to give you some feedback on how to improve page load performance, not only for desktop, but for mobile. So here I can see, if I scroll down, this is desktop. And these are some of the opportunities that I can address when trying to improve the page load time of that particular page. So here I could see there's some server response time issues. Image sizes probably need to be resized. I can remove unused CSS. Okay, so there are a lot of different things I can do to improve the page load time on this particular page. Okay, this is for desktop. I can also see mobile. So mobile, a lot of the same issues. So if we address these, these opportunities, then we could see a lift in page load time. We see a lift in page load time. We're going to probably see a lift in organic rankings or even user engagement. Because if a page takes a long time to load, a user is probably not going to stay on that page very long. So to me, site speed is an important report under behavior. Now, one more report here that I want to point out under behavior is events. And to me, events are important. So if you're trying to measure engagement on your website, you need to make sure you have event tracking set up. And when we talk about event tracking, we're talking about measuring things that analytics doesn't measure by default. So if you have a button on your website, if you have a PDF download, if you have a submit button on a form submission, if you have a subscribe button, if you have a video, if you have an external link, anything that is going to trigger engagement on your website, you need to measure with event tracking. And event tracking is simply set up by breaking out the event into a category, an action, and a label. And so here we could see for our particular website, we have categories already set up for event tracking. So here, for example, I can see on line six, video. I can see how many people actually watched our video. Okay, so here's the action, video start. Okay, so over this period of time, I could see I had 49 unique events, 50 total. So that's how many people actually watched the video. And you can always revert to label, and that'll tell you what page people watched, in this case, the video. So event tracking is important because we want to be able to measure engagement. So if you go to events under behavior and you don't see any events listed, you probably need to get that set up. And that is set up through Google Tag Manager. So what you want to do is you want to be able to set up your events through Google Tag Manager, which is another Google platform, but you certainly want to do that. So that's where you set up your events. When you set up your events for your website with a category and action and label, you'll be able to measure those events in analytics under behavior, under events. And the important thing here is you'll be able to measure engagement. So I'll be able to see how many people came to the site and how many people clicked on a button, downloaded a PDF, uh, submitted a form, uh, played a video, did whatever we wanted them to do. So events are important. So let's move from behavior to conversions. And this is important because 
we want to be able to measure conversions on a website. So analytics has four types of conversions. So if I go to admin down at the bottom and then I go to goals, I could see that I have four different types of goals that I can use. Now, right now, I have event related goals set up for the website, for this particular website. So we just talked about event tracking. So if you're measuring a button click on your website, you can certainly turn that into a goal. And so all you need to do is tell analytics, hey, this is the particular category, this is the particular action. So for example, if I click on this particular goal and take a look at it, I can see that we have a category set up that anything that resembles donate now, okay, or donate, go ahead and fire this event as a conversion. Okay, so event is one type of goal. Another type of goal is destination. So if somebody goes to a specific page, like a confirmation page, we can turn that into a goal. So here I could see if somebody goes to donation dash confirmation, then analytics is going to fire that goal as a conversion. And we're going to see a conversion against a different metric or different dimension like channel or audience. Okay. So destination is the second type of goal. The third type of goal is duration. So how long did somebody stay on my website? So in this example, if they stayed at least one minute and 30 seconds or more, then analytics is going to count that as a goal conversion. Okay, so duration is the third type. And then the fourth type is pages per session. Okay, so if I look at this example here, if a user came to my website and looked at more than three pages in that particular session, then analytics is going to fire a goal conversion. So four types of goals. You don't have to set up all four different types. My recommendation is at least have one goal set up. If you're not sure what goal to set up, then at least set up a duration or pages per session. Okay. So at least you can measure how long somebody stays on your website or how many pages they went to. Okay. So when you actually do have these goals set up, you can go back into conversions. We can go back into goals. We can go back into overview and we can measure our goal completions over this period of time. So here I could see 313 goal completions total with a goal conversion rate of 1.88%. And then I could see it broken down by goal type. So remember the only goals I have available and set up are event related goals. So 69 newsletter signups, 156 donate click buttons, I have 32 contact form submissions, 37 email click completions, and then 11 phone number click completions. So I can measure engagement as a goal. And so goals generally are important to the business. So you want to make sure that if you have a goal for your website, then you want to be able to set that up as a goal in Google Analytics. So that way, when you're looking at example channels, if I go back to my channels report, I can then measure channel by goal conversion. So these are all goals. But if I want to look at, for example, how many people from organic search clicked on the donate now button, I could see that I could see year to date, 10,887 users, which meant 11,000 sessions, 76 clicked on that donate now button. And that's comes out to 0.65% conversion rate. Okay. So that's important. So you want to be able to measure any dimension, whether that be channel, source, medium, keyword, campaign, mobile device, could be demographic, uh, gender or age. You want to be able to measure any dimension against the goals you have set up so you can measure performance. And that also includes pages or landing pages as well. So that's a quick overview of what you can expect to see in Google Analytics. Again, audience, acquisition, behavior, and conversions. So there are a lot of data in Google Analytics, but you want to be able to take advantage of the data in order to improve website performance. Now let's jump over to YouTube Analytics because 
If you have videos on YouTube, if you have a channel set up, some playlists, you'll be able to get some really good insights as to how your video is performing. And so here I could see I'm in YouTube. All I did was I went to my account, then I went to the beta, the studio version of YouTube, and then from there I went to analytics. So my account, YouTube studio, analytics, and analytics here is going to give me all sorts of information about my videos. Okay, so here I could see over the last 28 days, my videos produced over 8,600 views. My watch time in minutes totaled over 17,000, and I've netted 48 subscribers. And this is an overall, okay, so I can actually see when I publish videos and I can see the date they were published and here I'm looking at you know total views over this particular date range I can also see specifics on a particular video so I could see the top video in terms of minutes here I could see this particular video had 602 minutes over the last 28 days so here I could see views on a particular video so this is just an overview I could certainly look at some other information. If I click on reach viewers, I could see the total impressions. So how many times my video was viewed or how many people looked at it, okay? And then the click-through rate. So here I could see the different traffic sources. So 29% came externally. Okay, here I could see 25% came within YouTube itself. I could see how many times a video was viewed and played via playlist, via suggested video. So I could see different ways in which the traffic found my video and actually watched it. Here I could see externally how people were able to find my videos. And I could see 46% found it via Google search. I see some lots of information here uh, about sources of traffic how the traffic got to these videos. So I could see then once the traffic found my videos, how many times they actually saw it and viewed it and then watched it. So that's how many times I was able to reach viewers via different sources and then their reaction to that, how many times they saw it and watched it. Here I can click on interest viewers. So again, I could see the top videos in terms of watch time i could see the top playlist so here i could see my partner's playlist was the top playlist so i can see some interest here in terms of average view duration and then here we have build an audience so we can look at specific audiences if we have them built in youtube to see how many people actually watch my videos so here i can see 88 percent of the people who watched my videos over the last 28 days were not even subscribed so that tells me a lot of people are finding my videos, spending some time watching them, but they're not subscribed. So we're trying to get them to subscribe to our channel so they can watch more. So a lot of information here in YouTube itself about how our videos performed. Again, this is good insight because ideally what you wanna do is you really want to take a look at a specific video, see how it's performing. So if I just click on one particular video, I can actually see the audience retention over the course of the video itself. I could see the ways in which people found the video. Okay, again, externally or via YouTube search. I could see how many people liked it or disliked it. I could see all sorts of information on a particular video itself or an overview of my channel. So that's all available to you in YouTube Analytics under YouTube Studio. So take advantage of that. So if you're publishing videos on a regular basis, you want to hone in on how your videos are performing. So if you have any additional questions about YouTube analytics or YouTube in general, take a look at our video that we created earlier this year about how to create a YouTube channel. We go into some in-depth insights into youtube itself especially youtube analytics so take a look at that video and if you have any other insights about youtube analytics or analytics in general go ahead and put a comment below this video so let's turn our attention to competitor spying tools very important to keep tabs on what the competition's doing and there are a lot of tools out there so when it comes to social we can use a freemium tool like sprout social 
to listen in on our competitors. We can use another freemium tool, Social Blade. There's a popular tool out there called SpyFu. That's freemium as well. Moz, we looked at Moz earlier for keyword and organic. Moz is a great tool for also leveraging our competitors in terms of backlinks. And BuzzSumo, so that's another freemium tool. Again, there are lots of tools out there. These are just examples of some of the tools that we use here at Simply Learn. I use personally and professionally to get a sense of what our competition's doing. So why would we want to use a competitor spying tool? Well, it may sound like a very straightforward question, but there are lots of reasons why. And so let's look at some of these reasons. And the first reason is we really want to identify, you know, our competitors backlinks and monitor changes in their ranking. So the reason why we have this as the top bullet point is because SEO organic search is a long-term strategy on page off page website very technical and creative there's a lot going on with seo a lot going on and sometimes it takes a long time to rank for something and a lot of seo does depend on relevancy relevancy being how many quality backlinks are linked to you so it's always good to leverage what your competitors are doing so you can see how you stack up and so that's why this is up there as number one we want to be able to really take a look at what our competitors are doing another example would be hey how much uh, traffic a competitor is gaining on certain keywords this could go either way for paid search organic search what are competitors bidding on are they really getting traffic from those keywords? So there are tools out there that help us leverage what our competition's doing. Okay, we can also identify our competitors' top performing content for relevant topics. Okay, we can determine what our competitors' website referral traffic is. Okay, we can pull our competitors' data and compare it with our own campaigns. So lots of tools out there to help you do this. And we may want to track the total amount of clicks a competitor receives and how much they pay for each keyword. So let's go ahead and take a look at a few examples, how we can leverage all these bullet points that we just discussed. And so we're going to start out with Sprout Social. And Sprout Social is a tool I use. It's a social media platform. There's a lot of things you can do with Sprout Social. Definitely generate reports for your social media platforms. You could set up posts that get published at a certain time and day. But there's also one particular tool in here called Listening. And so what we could do is we just put in, for example, RV rentals in Twitter. So what we're doing is we're actually listening to see who else is is tweeting about RV rentals. So we could do this for Twitter, we could do it Facebook, some other social media platforms. The whole idea here on Sprout Social is to get a sense of what our competitors are doing. So we could have easily put in a brand name. We're just going general here because we want to rank for the keyword RV rentals. And so here we could take a look at, you know, what some of these particular brands are doing like Go RV Rentals, Cruise America RV, we could see, just scroll down, and we can get a sense of, in particular, what people are tweeting about, what other companies are tweeting when it comes to this particular keyword, RV rentals. Now, if I want to hone in on a particular competitor, I could just really refine my search for that competitor's brand name, so RV Share. So here I can take a look at you know what they're doing when they're posting tw or tweeting, how long ago, the time of day, get an idea of what they're actually saying, what campaigns they're promoting. Okay, I can get a sense of everything about this tweet. And so here I can scroll down and I can see what's been shared by other people for this particular brand. And I can see a lot of people are, as an example, retweeting this particular giveaway. And so to me, it just gives me a sense in this particular example on Twitter as to what our competitor's doing. Okay, let's turn our attention to SEO. So remember that first bullet point, we wanna get a sense of what our competitors are doing when it comes to backlinks. And so Moz has a great tool called Link Explorer. And Link Explorer, there allows us to actually compare link profiles. So for my domain, I can go ahead and put my competitors' domains in there and definitely get a sense of 
you know, to how many links my competitors have, external, inter internal. I can get a sense of the domain authority. I can get a sense of page authority, linking domains. So I can really do a, a comparison across my domain and my competitor's domains to get a snapshot of how I compare against my competitors. So this gives me an overview of everything I need to know organically. Now Moz also has a, another great tool under Link Explorer called Link Intersect. And I like Link Intersect. I use it a lot because if our competitors really have a number of external links and domains pointing to their site and they have a better domain authority and page authority, then you know, I want to be able to, you know, see what they're doing, where they're linking, who's linking to them. I want to get be able to get a snapshot of why is their domain so much better than ours in terms of authority. And so the link intersect actually allows me to do that. So I can go ahead and put my competitors domains in there and then I can find opportunities. And so you just click on opportunities and you can see where my site intersects with their site. And if it doesn't actually intersect, then I have an opportunity to actually try and get a link on that particular site. So that's what the link intersect report does. It allows me to see where my links intersect with my competitors. And if it doesn't intersect, then I have an opportunity to generate a backlink. So that's ideally what the link intersect tool is. In Moz, it allows me to really get a sense of you know where I'm linking and where my competitors are linking. Now, what we can also do is also take advantage of another report under Moz's Link Explorer and the Discovered and Lost report. So we could put in our domain or we could put even our competitor's domain in there. And we can get a sense of what domains were found and linked to them. So really within Moz, we can get a good snapshot of what websites are linking to our competitors. We get a good snapshot of the overall links to our competitor sites and specifically what sites. So the whole idea is if it's good for our competitors, meaning they're linking from a site that has a good domain authority and low spam score, then it's probably a site I want to be able to tackle as well. Okay, so you have discovered and lost. Okay, you have comparing link profiles and you have link intersect. So those are three good reports you can leverage right in Moz's Link Explorer tool. Now there's one more report we can leverage in Moz, and that's the inbound links report. And so we can go ahead and type in our competitor's domain here. And again, we can get a snapshot of what their domain authority is, page authority for the home page. But really, this is what we're after, linking domains. So this particular domain has over 9,000 linking domains. So what we can do is actually go through and see, based on domain authority, I could sort by domain authority where these pages are being linked from. And so here I can see Reddit, Reddit, Reddit. So a lot of Reddit here, which is a good site for backlinking, New York Times. So, you know, there's a lot of different uh, sites here, Washington Post. So I can get a good snapshot of my competitor by seeing every link that's pointing to them. Now, of course, I don't want to go through 9,000 links. I can really just hone in on a specific link source or link type or link state. So I can really filter it if I wanted to. I can export the report and do some further analysis. But really the whole idea here is I could see what URL is linking to this particular competitor site, what the anchor text is, what the page and domain authority is. So this gives me a really, really good insight on all the backlinking that my competitor has. And again, if I'm trying to catch my competitor, it's probably not a bad idea to look at what they're doing and even copy what they're doing in terms of backlinking. So if we're not on Reddit, then we probably need to be on Reddit because if that's where our competitor is and they're getting good link juice, from Reddit, which has a domain authority of 90, then hey, if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander, so they say. So inbound links is a, just another good report you can leverage in Moz under the Link Explorer. 
reporting tool. Now, if I want to get a good snapshot as to what my competitor's doing on search exactly, well, look no further than SpyFu. So SpyFu is a another tool that you can leverage from a PPC SEO perspective. You know, from an SEO perspective, you got some backlinking data as well, just like you did in Moz. From a PPC perspective, you can get some good keyword insights. And so here, I just went ahead and typed in the domain. And what this is gonna do is just give me an overall snapshot for my competitor's domain. So here, I could see, you know, how many organic keywords they're found for, the estimated monthly SEO clicks they're getting based on the volume of those keywords. Okay, I could see here the keywords their top competitors also rank for, the rank history, 12 years. So this particular domain's been around a long time. Okay, so that's on the organic side. I can flip over to the paid side and I could see that they are doing paid search. I could see 5,000 plus keywords they're bidding on. Okay, based on that, what they're actually paying. And then I could see you know, some of the other competitors listed here from a paid perspective and an organic perspective. I could see the shared keyword overlap. Okay, now again, you can pay for this because it's freemium and get some really good insights as to how your domain compares to your competitors. So I'm using the free version and here the free version, SpyFu is just giving me some overall data on the specific domain I entered in. And so I entered in my competitors. You can certainly enter in your own domain to get a sense of organic keywords and paid keywords. So you can see top keywords, top paid keywords. Okay, this is Google Ads. Okay, so this is what recommendations as to what to purchase. Okay, here you can see some even some at Google Ads history. I can see exactly what ad copy my competitor actually wrote and for what keyword. And then I can see some organic ranking history here as I keep scrolling down this overview report. So I can see for RV rent where they rank. And then I can see inbound links just like I did in Moz. SpyFu is providing me with some insight as to, hey, what links are pointing to them and what the domain strength is and how many clicks they expect to receive. So this is all free data, take it or leave it, but it's all free data available to you under SpyFu. So SpyFu gives you kind of an overview for free, some really in-depth analysis if you actually pay for it. And it just really hones in on what your competitors are bidding for paid wise and what they're ranking for organic wise. And so SpyFu is a really good tool to leverage if you just want to get a snapshot of how your competitor uh, overlaps with you. So let's turn our attention to Google Analytics because in Google Analytics under audience, I can go to benchmarking and basically the benchmarking reports allows me to see what the industry as a whole is doing compared to my own website. Now the caveat here on this particular report is that it's all anonymous data. So I can't exactly see what competitor is doing what in this report. But if I hone in on my industry, in this case, autos and vehicles, and I hone in on a specific country or adjust the size of the daily sessions that I get, then I can see, hey, analytics in this case, in this example, is sharing 8,863 web properties. Okay, so they're sharing the data for over 8,000 web properties, and I can compare those web properties against my own. So if we're all in the same industry, it gives me a sense here as to how I stack up against the industry as a whole, in this case, as it pertains to channels. So you can see here, red not good green is good so in the industry we're not doing as good as others in the same industry who are receiving the same amount of sessions now we could certainly adjust and we can adjust our locale and if we do that Google's going to be able to adjust how many web properties are actually contributing to the report and so when analytics makes that adjustment we're going to be able to see in this case just New Zealand. So we're going to adjust for New Zealand and we're going to go with a 4,999. And so we could see there are about, you know, 300 something web properties contributing 47 web properties now contributing to this report. So if we're focused on the New Zealand region, and this is the amount of traffic we get, 
we're now comparing us against 47 other anonymous web properties. So now if I go back to the report after I've honed in, I'm looking at channels and I could see how many sessions we're getting by channels and how I compare against the competition. I can also measure up against percentage of new sessions, new users, pages per session, average session duration, bounce rate. But that's just channels. I can also do location and devices. So the whole idea behind this report is yes, you're not honing in on a particular competitor, but you're honing in on your industry. So you're getting a good idea as to how you compare against your industry just by making some adjustments in the benchmarking report. You obviously want to make sure you're looking at the same industry, adjust for your country or region, adjust for the site size, meaning how many sessions you actually get on a daily basis, and then analytics will do the rest. They'll compare you against those in your industry. And so I find this to be a good tool because it allows me to stack up our site against those in the industry. And obviously if we're not driving as many sessions, especially say from organic, then we have our work cut out for us, okay? So that's the whole idea behind the benchmarking report. Now, if you wanna get some good insight as to what the competitors are doing and you don't wanna use a tool, well, look no farther. You can always go to google.com, okay? So this is how we used to do it back in the day before all these tools became available. You just typed in a keyword and we're gonna type in RV rentals and now we're gonna be able to see who's bidding on that keyword. So we could see we have a number of different uh, companies bidding on the keyword we're interested in. Okay, here I can see some featured snippets. Okay, and then I could see some organic search results. Okay, if I scroll down, I'll be able to see some other companies bidding on that same keyword, meaning they're paying for RV rentals. So if I clicked on somebody's link here, they're actually going to pay Google for the click. And so this just gives me a good sense of, you know, how many people are actually trying to rank for this keyword or trying to be found for this keyword. So that's all I did. I just did a search. Now, from an organic perspective, if you really want to hone in on your competition, you can always do the syntax all in title, colon, and then hit enter. So now I could see I have 163,000 results. And what does that tell me? That tells me that I have 163,000 websites with RV rentals in the title tag. So if you're trying to optimize for the keyword RV rentals as an example, then you know that you have 163,000 different listings ahead of you that you need to jump over in order to rank for the keyword RV rentals. So using the all in title syntax and the keyword right after that actually just gives you a more accurate picture of how many sites are actually ahead of you for a particular keyword. So that's the whole idea. So if I get rid of the syntax, and uh, you can see for RV rentals, I have 132 million, but that's not really accurate because not all these listings have the keyword RV rentals in the title tag. And title tag, if you're working on organic search, is one of the key important factors for ranking. So you need to have that keyword in the title tag. So that's the whole idea behind using the all in title syntax. It gives us a good idea as to what our competition's doing and how many sites we have to jump over to get to number one on Google. Now, if you're running Google ads, just as we did with RV rentals, we went up there and we saw, we typed that in as a query and we saw how many advertisers there were for RV rentals. Now, if we are running our own campaigns, Google ads actually has a good report that I really like. It's called Auction Insights. And so you can get to Auction Insights just by clicking on Campaigns, and then from Campaigns, click on Auction Insights. And what Auction Insights allows us to see is what competitors or domains are bidding on the same keywords we are. And so what Google does here is it allows us to actually see where we stack up against our competition for all the keywords we're bidding on. And so here I'm looking at year to date, and here we could see us and I can see our competitors. Okay, so I could see impression share. So for if we're talking about one keyword, every keyword has a hundred percent impression share. How much of that impression share are you getting? And when we say impression share, meaning eyeballs, when we talk about eyeballs, are we getting a majority of the eyeballs 
or our competitors get a majority of the eyeballs. So we can see our average position. I can see how often I overlap with my competitors. Okay, I could see how often I'm above a particular competitor. I could see what percentage I'm at the top of the page versus my competitors, the absolute top of page rate, and then I can see how often I outrank my competitors and vice versa, how often my competitors outrank me. So I can see all this good insight as to what competitors are bidding on the same keywords I am. Okay, so this is if you're running Google Ads. Okay, so if you're running Google Ads, okay, you can just click on the Auction Insights Report. You can find that in the top navigation just by clicking on Campaigns. And by doing so, you'll be able to gain some insights as to where you stack up from a paid search perspective against your competitors. So let's turn our attention to paid marketing tools. So if you're doing some advertising on Google, Bing, LinkedIn, you probably want to work within those platforms as the tool of choice. So, you know, if you're doing paid search on say googlesearch.com or display, you could be doing display advertising on, you know, a network like AdRoll or Google. Or you could be doing social media paid ads, say on Facebook. So whatever it is you're doing, you probably want to work within that platform itself to get the ideal data that you need. Okay, so here are some of the tools, some of the places you can go. Of course, if you work in Google Ads, you also have Google Ads Editor that you can leverage. Okay, and I'll show you that in a couple minutes. You have Google Ads Keyword Planner course both of these are paid if you're running campaigns okay so Bing if you're running campaigns on Bing okay you get all this good data that you can digest through some reporting okay you also have some third-party tools out there that you also have to pay for in WordStream okay so WordStream is a third-party tool that you can leverage Bing and Google our actual advertising network. So you would advertise on the platform itself and get all the data you need right in the platform and leverage a lot of the tools that they have available in the platform. As I mentioned, you could also use Google Ads Editor. Uh, so Bing also has their own editor as well. So, and as well as Facebook. So you can use an editor type version and I'll show you that here in a couple minutes, but let's talk about why we want to use the tools in the platform itself. Well, we want to be able to monitor how our ads performing. So which ad receives the most traffic as an example. We want to identify keywords that are performing for us. Okay, so are keywords converting, not converting? Are they costing us a lot of money and not netting a high enough return for us? So we want to keep an eye on that. Okay, so we want to monitor our cost, okay, across different locations and devices. Not only cost, but we want to also monitor how our ads are performing across different locations and devices keywords across different locations and devices. So we want to be able to measure by device. Okay, so we also want to analyze competitors data. And as we showed you in the competitor section, Google, as an example, has auction insights reporting. Analytics has benchmarking. So Google itself does provide some information in the case of auction insights as to how uh, your competitors are performing against you on Google search. So that's on the paid search side. Then you have display. Okay. So display advertisements. Okay. You're across a different network. So there are different types of networks out there. For example, ad roll. Okay. You have Criteo. Seltra is another paid version of, or paid tool you can use in wide orbit. So these are some of the paid marketing tools you can leverage. Of course, I like to stay, if I'm advertising on Google, I like to stay uh, in Google Ads and measure my display performance that way. But if you're on AdRoll, for example, then you wanna leverage AdRoll's reporting platform and some of the tools they have to offer. So if we look at display, why do we wanna leverage some of these tools? Well, just like search, for example, where we wanna look at keyword and ad performance, same kind of concept here. We wanna be able to monitor whether we have the right keywords and right customer engagement. So when, we, when it comes to display, we want to be able to make sure we're choosing the right audience. Of course, that means 
looking at not only audience insights, but our target insights as well. Are we reaching the right audience when it comes to display? And Google has a good breakdown that I'm gonna be able to show you here in a couple of minutes. Okay, so we wanna improve our campaigns by monitoring our competitors' display ads as well. So there are tools available that'll help you do that. And that's on the display side. And if we look at social, okay, why, what tools can we use on social? Well, you got Facebook Ads Manager, okay? You got Ad Espresso, Quaya, Tweepy, you got all these cool paid search tools. Again, I usually stick with where I'm advertising. So if I'm advertising on LinkedIn or Twitter, I'm gonna leverage that platform, but just know that there are other tools available for you. So with social, like display, it's all about targeting our audience. So for these, some of the tools like on Facebook, we can review and relaunch our ad campaigns based on target audience. We can measure conversions and gain insights in this example about Facebook users. How are our users interacting with our ads? And then we want to target people based on their activities, such as purchase intent, device usage, travel preferences, etc. So social allows us to do that. And then with Facebook, as an example, we can monitor any A-B test we run. For example, if we're running call to action test, we can measure the results of that right in Facebook. And I'm going to show you an example of that here shortly. So let's jump right into Google Ads and look at some tools available to us from the search side of the house. So if we're running search campaigns, right in Google Ads, we could see campaign data, we could see keyword data, we could see ad data. So for example, if I wanna see what ads are performing, I'm just gonna click on my ads and extensions. Okay, and here are my ads. And now I could see what ads are performing in terms of clicks, click-through rates, etc. And so that way I can go ahead and pause ads, activate ads. So that's right here in the Google Ads uh, platform itself. Now, if I want to look at specific keywords, I can do that. So I can see what keywords are driving traffic and clicks. Here I could just sort by clicks. And now I could see not only what keywords are driving clicks, I could see what the click-through rate is. I can see the impressions, how many people actually viewed my ad after click typing in a keyword query that I'm bidding on. I could see how much I've paid by keyword. And more importantly, I wanna be able to see conversions or conversion rate. And then with Google Ads, you have quality score. So we wanna be able to measure quality score. So this is a Google Ads keyword reporting. And so the great thing about the keyword reporting is that there's some other features available to me here. So here I can add negative keywords, okay, just by clicking on negative keywords. I can also see a search terms report. And so when it comes to search terms, I can actually see what specific keywords people typed in. And based on the keyword that somebody typed in as a query, I can see what match type triggered that particular ad. And so if I see a keyword query that I don't particularly care to be shown for or I want my ad shown for, then I can go ahead and just select it and I can add it as a negative keyword. Okay, so that tool is available to you right in Google Ads. Okay, and then you have the auction insights. So we have reviewed the auction insights when we're looking at competitive analysis. And so here, if we look at the auction insights, we'll be able to adjust our date range and we'll be able to see basically, you know, who else is bidding on the keywords and what their impression share is, what their average position is, what their overlap rate is, position above rate, top of page, absolute top of page rate now ranking share. So once we have Google has data, then they'll be able to share that information with you. Okay, so that's just keywords, but there's a cool tool that I really like and I leverage it for SEO and pay-per-click and that's Google's Keyword Planner. So if you click on tools and then you can click on Keyword Planner, we'll be able to leverage the Keyword Planner. And the whole idea behind the Keyword Planner is do we want to discover new keywords? Or for the keywords we have selected, we can get volume and forecast on that. So here, let's type in a keyword, mail delivery. And if I click get started, okay, so Google's going to give me some other keyword ideas and they're gonna give me 
what the average monthly searches are for that keyword. They're going to let me know the competition. They're going to give me a range in terms of how much I can expect to pay for that keyword. So if I happen to click on that keyword, I can add it to a plan. And then once I've added to a plan, then I can go ahead and look at that plan and measure what kind of volume I'm going to get and how much I can expect to pay. So now once I've added my keyword to that plan, I can go ahead and see how many clicks and impressions and costs and click the rate and average cost per click I can expect to spend. So, and this is based on a maximum CPC of $2. So I can go ahead and adjust my plan accordingly if I want to in order to see basically how much I can expect to spend. So that's the whole idea behind the keyword planner in terms of choosing new keywords. And once you choose keywords you're interested in bidding on, you can actually do a forecast to see exactly how much you can expect to spend, how many clicks, how many impressions you can expect to get. And if you have conversions set up, how many conversions you can expect to receive. So that's all part of Google's keyword plan. That's viewing forecast as well as choosing keywords. So there are so many different tools and features within Google ads. We need a whole, whole segment just on this. So really I'm just going to highlight some of the more important tools and features. So I mentioned the keyword planner. I mentioned the campaigns, keywords and ads reports. Another thing I would look at in Google ads. Again, we mentioned this as one of our key defining. Why would we use it? bullet point and that's because of devices. So we mentioned devices. Why would we use Google ads reporting tool? Because we want to look at devices and we want to be able to see what devices are driving traffic from what campaign. And then the cool thing about Google ads is right in Google ads platform. You can go ahead and do a bid adjustment. So if I increase my bid adjustment, for example, on mobile phones, then my particular ad in this particular campaign is going to show more than on computer. So I can always decrease it. For example, do a bit adjustment on computer and that means I'm going to show my ads less. So I can go ahead and do bit adjustments based on device. That's the cool thing of working right in Google ads platform is you can make adjustments right here in the platform based on devices. Well, you also have locations too. So we mentioned that as one of the reasons why we want to use some of these tools. And if I see a particular location, I'm not interested in advertising. Well, I can always select it and I can always just pause it or remove it. So, or I can change the bid adjustment on a location as well. So I can make a lot of different changes right in the Google ads platform for those seasoned in search advertising, paid search advertising, especially on Google ads, you can always use Google ads editor. All you need to do is just do a search for Google ads editor. You can download it. So basically what Google ads editor is, it's a, it's a tool. It's the software that you work your camp with your campaigns on locally. So you're making changes to your campaigns on your computer. And basically when you're done making changes, you can always upload them to Google ads to the account on Google ads in the cloud, so to speak. So that's the whole idea behind Google ads editor. It's a great tool for you to use. If you want to make household changes really quick, for example, I'm looking at an account with a bunch of campaigns. So now if I click on one of those campaigns, I could see the ad groups here. Okay. So for example, I just wanted to turn off all these ad groups. I can just highlight them all and just click status enabled to paused and I can revert back if I want to. Okay. So you can make household changes. So here I could see the campaign, the ad group level. If I choose an ad group, then I can see some keywords. And again, I can make changes at nauseum here. I can copy, I can paste, I can delete. Okay, so I can make a lot of changes really quick right in Google Ads Editor. And that's the whole point of Editor is to go ahead and work locally while somebody else is working locally on the same account. You could both be working simultaneously and being more efficient on getting things done in the campaign. Now, if you are working with somebody else on the campaign, you want to make sure that you get recent changes. So 
If I say get recent changes to all campaigns, what Google Editor is going to do is contact Google Ads in the cloud and download all those changes. So here I can see the changes being downloaded in Editor from Google Ads. And when it's done, it's going to highlight all the changes that have been made. And so once I'm done reviewing those changes, I can go ahead and click done. And now I know I have the recent latest changes in editor. So now I can go ahead and continue to make some changes. And when I'm done making changes, I can go ahead and post them. So that's the beauty of Google ads editor. Bing has a version. Facebook has a version. It allows you to again, go at the keyword level, the ad group level. Okay. You can look at ads itself and make changes to the ads. Okay, you could do a lot of different things right in editor. In fact, you could do pretty much most of what you could do in Google ads, you can do in Google ads editor. And so that's Google ads editor. To me, I would recommend it if you're experienced with Google ads. Again, it's software, you have to download it. You're gonna use it on your computer as software. But when you make changes, all you need to do is post those changes or get recent changes that have been made on Google ads. And so that's Google editor ads editor in summary. Now let's go back into Google ads and talk about display advertising because display is a different network, but the platform's still the same. And some of the same tools are available from the search network as well as for the display network, right in Google ads. So if I want to take a look at a campaign and ad group on the display network, I could just click on that ad group and i can look at the ads that are running for that particular ad group on the display network so here the difference being on the display network is you can use image ads on the search network you can only use text ads so here i can look at image ads and i can see how they're performing in fact you could even go a step further and use responsive display ads so google has responsive display ads meaning it's going to respond to what's performing best okay and so now i could see clicks impressions click through rate etc right on on my ads and extensions report in google ads platform now this happens to be a retargeting campaign so if we click on audiences we'll be able to see what audiences we're targeting here okay so when this report loads when you run retargeting campaigns you're targeting a specific audience and so we want to be able to see okay of the audiences we have set up what audience is performing best okay so here i can see a breakout by audience again i could see the same metrics i could see on the search side i could see clicks impressions click the rate more importantly i want to be able to measure conversions Okay, so that's the whole idea when you're in these platforms and you're paying for ads is you want to be able to measure against conversions and you can also measure against cost per conversion, conversion rate. Okay, so those are some key metrics to measure up against, whether it's audience, keyword, ad, whatever the dimension is. So here on the display network, we can get a sense of demographics. Okay, so unlike the search network, the display network allows us to see demographic data. And so now I could see an age breakout or an age range breakout that Google provides us. And I could see again, based on the age range breakout, which age range has the most clicks, impressions, et cetera, including conversions. So you also have the opportunity on the display network to add keywords. You have the opportunity to add topics and you have the opportunity to see placements or run placements so here if i click on where ads have shown i can actually see where my ads have shown up for this display campaign and google ads allows you the ability to go ahead and you can exclude it from the ad group or exclude a specific placement from a campaign so you could take action on a specific placement and I can see the type of placement, whether it's a mobile app, whether it's a site, I can go ahead and see exactly where that placement was. So that's the placements report. You have demographics, you have audiences, you have keywords, you have all these different reports available to you on the Google Ads platform. So before we jump over to social media, paid search advertising, I just wanna remind you, we do have you know a nice tutorial on Google Ads. Okay, so take a look at the Google Ads tutorial we have set up on YouTube. 
Okay, if you search for Google Ads Tutorial 2019, this is a good uh, tutorial on everything related to Google Ads. So check out this video because in today's webinar, we're just mentioning tools across the board. And if you are advertising on Google Ads, as most people do, then you, you could see just how powerful it is and all the different features that are available. So take a look at the video. It's a nice complimentary video to this one, this digital marketing tools, and this will give you a nice and in, deeper insight into everything that's available on Google ads. And if you have any tools or features on Google ads, whether it's the search network or whether that's the display network, then feel free to comment below this video. Happy to hear your comments about what tools and reports and features you specifically use in Google ads. So let's move into uh, Facebook ads manager and show you how the platform looks when you're running ads on Facebook. So we can look at all the different tools and reports available here. So here we could see if we're in the Facebook ads manager, we could see our campaigns, we could see our ad sets, and we can see our ads. So just like on Google Ads, you have less side navigation so we can drill down. So if we wanna see ad sets, for example, we could just click on ad sets that are showing up in this particular account. And here we could see we have two ad sets that are live. So if I click on one of these ad sets, I'll be able to see an actual ad that's running here and so for the actual ad that's running i can then see the results of that ad and how it's performing for example you know how many clicks it's received what the reach is what the impressions are so impressions similar to google ads how many people are actually looking at the ad and then I can see the cost per click here at $1 as an example. And so now I can go in and I can go ahead and look at the ad performance and go ahead and change out that ad if it's not performing to my expectation. So if I click on more tools and then creatives, I can just simply click on creatives and then I can actually see the creatives I actually have running for that campaign I selected. So now I can see all the creatives that are running and I can see the results of those creatives. So Facebook Ads Manager also has uh, re different reporting. So if I click on the reports pull down menu, you can see here I can see some standard reports by ad, ad set, age and gender. And then I can see all reports here listed out by placement, by placement and device, time of day, country, etc. So if we just look at age and gender, we'll be able to get a breakout age and gender here. So you can see by campaign, I'm looking at all campaigns here and I'm looking at just age and gender. I can certainly deselect one of these and I can look at a specific time range. So now I could see who's looking at my ad specifically. So here I could see 35 to 44 female. I could see the reach impressions and how often they're actually seeing my ad. Now this is key for Facebook because if somebody's seeing your ad a lot, they're probably gonna tune out to it. So that's what makes the frequency metric so important on Facebook because then we can go ahead and you know turn off that particular age and gender if we needed to. And we could see how much we spent. So this just gives you some idea of the type of reporting that's available in Facebook Ads Manager. Now, the great thing about Facebook uh, reporting in Ads Manager is, you know, I can group or ungroup uh, my dimensions if I needed to. I could change the view and arrange columns. I can get rid of columns just as you would in Google Ads reporting, very similar stature here. So I have a lot of flexibility here on how I review the reports. You know, you got different metrics that you could pick and choose as well, okay? And you got lots of different flexibility when you're looking at the reports on how your campaigns are performing. Now here I can pick and choose. I can choose campaign, ad set, ads, objective. Again, I can choose different demographics. So I have a lot of options available to me in terms of how I want to, you know, view the performance of my campaign, view the performance of my ad set or my ad. Now remember, if you're in Facebook, you can always go in and edit the campaign. You can edit the ad set. 
Remember in the ad set, that's where a lot of your decisions are gonna be made, including how you wanna drive the traffic, okay, what your budget is, okay, you can basically choose your audience here. So you're gonna be able to choose what type of campaign it's gonna be, and based on that campaign, you're gonna go ahead and choose the kind of audience you wanna focus in on. You're gonna be able to choose the location, the age range, the gender. So all of this is going to be set up in the ad set or the campaign or the ad. If you go ahead and edit an ad, remember you can do A-B testing as well. So you have a lot of different options and features available to you right in Ads Manager when you're managing your paid search campaigns on Facebook. So if you want some more information about all the different features and tools in Facebook Ads Manager, check out the Facebook Ads Tutorial 2019 uh, webinar that we did earlier this year. In addition, you can also look at another one that we did on Facebook called Facebook Advertising Tips and Strategies. So that should give you some sense of everything related to Facebook Ads and how to take advantage of the Facebook Ads Manager platform. So if there's anything on social that we may have missed or that you use, feel free to add a comment below the video. We'd love to hear your feedback. Okay, let's talk about some affiliate marketing tools. Let's turn our attention to affiliate marketing. A lot of affiliate marketing platforms out there. The number one probably is Commission Junction, also known as CJ. They're an affiliate platform. They have an, a freemium model, meaning you can have a free trial, but basically you're going to have to move on and pay for the platform. Likewise, for has offers, you have volume. You, you Really, when it comes to affiliate marketing, a lot of platforms out there. Click Inc., AWIN. So a lot of these are brokers per se. And when I say brokers, like for example with CJ, you as a merchant or you as a publisher can get in touch with a merchant. You as a merchant can get in touch with a publisher, meaning CJ helps bridge the gap between you finding somebody to build your network with. Okay, so that's what really affiliate marketing is. And you need, really need a platform to kind of put it all together. And there's a lot of, lot of affiliate marketing platforms. We're actually going to take a look at CJ and go through some of the features in the platform here shortly. But let's just take a look at why we need these affiliate marketing tools. Well, these affiliate marketing tools identify you know, affiliates, influencers, employees, other advocates you want to partner with. So again, you could be on the merchant side, you could be actually selling a product, and you're going to want somebody to help you sell that product. Somebody with a website who's an influencer, who drives a lot of traffic to their own site, who, you know, does sell, reputable brand, etc. So you need somebody to help you introduce you to these sites. Okay, so CJ and some of these other marketing platforms, affiliate marketing platforms do that. Okay, so these tools are there to do the introductions, the brokering, the relationship. So the other benefit here is you can contract with affiliates and track the traffic and conversions. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, if you do use CJ.com, by no means am I only endorsing that platform, there are plenty others out there. But whatever platform you use, you're going to want to be able to set up terms and conditions with that particular affiliate. So you could set up a terms and conditions for, say, 10% off all sales, as an example. Okay, well, you're going to need a platform that will help you broker that contract, okay, contract terms or program terms. Furthermore, you're going to need a platform to help you track, hey, is this affiliate helping me drive traffic or is this affiliate driving traffic to my products and is this affiliate helping me sell? So you, the, the, these platforms help you do just that. Okay, so you can gain high website rankings with the help of your affiliate, meaning that, hey, your affiliate can be promoting your product and if they're promoting your product, you have a chance to show up via paid search, organic search, off other websites, so social. So you have a lot of benefits to working with affiliate marketing in itself and the tools available will help you gain website rankings as one example. We want to be able to track 
certain metrics. Okay, so in affiliate marketing, you have earnings per click, EPC. As an example, most platforms measure EPC from a seven day period to a three month period. Okay, you can also figure out what the actual cost per click is, just like you do on, say, Google search. You can actually measure that in affiliate. Okay, you want to eliminate fraudulent clicks, impressions, and conversions. So any affiliate platform worth its weight is going to help you understand, you know, how many impressions and clicks and conversions you're getting and help you manage that in terms of fraudulent clicks or, hey, if you're getting a lot of impressions and no clicks, that's a problem too. So these platforms are really built on helping you manage your relationship with the affiliate by offering up all sorts of reports and tools you know the other big benefit here to affiliate marketing tool is hey we can influence our customers throughout their buying journey so we could set up different promotions based on hey did somebody go to the website did somebody see our product did somebody click on our product did somebody go into the shopping cart with our product did somebody purchase our product so there's all sorts of steps in the funnel so to speak and hey you can work with an affiliate a publisher to influence your customers throughout that purchasing funnel throughout that journey so let's go ahead and log in here so when you log in like any other digital marketing tool any other platform you're going to have your own settings and whatnot so really the whole idea behind any affiliate marketing tool is really there to manage your publishers who do you want as a publisher? Who do you want selling your product? You obviously want somebody who's relevant, somebody who's going to be able to sell the product, somebody who has a targeted audience that's similar to yours. Okay, so we go into cj.com. We're gonna log in and here you can see a publisher's link. So we're gonna click on the publisher's link. And remember, when you sign up publishers, you have to have program terms. And so if we click on publishers, program terms, we're gonna be able to see all the different program terms available. So here we could see the different program terms we have set up for certain publishers. So we just click on that, we'll be able to see that's the default program term. So remember, you could set up your own program term for any publisher. So as a best practice, if you have publishers who are actually performing well, who are selling your products, maybe you want to offer them a little bit more on the commission side. Maybe you want to sweeten the deal. Maybe, you know, these guys, these publishers get better program terms versus, say, other publishers who don't. And so here we can see the program terms. Basically, you could see what the terms are, the action, and the different policies here. So everything you need to do to manage that publisher in terms of payment is done under the program terms. Now, if the program terms are met, the publisher actually sells your products, CJ is the broker. They're the ones who are going to initiate the payment based on the program terms. So be careful on the program terms. You want to be able to set them appropriately. CJ has templates, CJ has some default program terms that you could use and offer up to different publishers. So based on the program terms, that's how your publishers are gonna get paid. And so here you can have as many different program terms as you want. There's no limit here. You wanna be able to align and reward program terms again, based on performance. And so here we can see what publishers are under what program terms. So again, if your publisher's performing well, sweeten the deal. Offer them a better program terms. And so you can align publishers with different program terms. And so that's the whole idea behind program terms is you want to be able to align publishers with that. So when you sign up a publisher, they're going to get aligned with a program term, meaning what are they gonna get paid for selling your product? Now, if we wanna manage by status instead of by program terms, we could see all the different organizations we have in our network. These are our publishers. We're the affiliate, we're the ones selling the product. We want to know who's selling, who's not selling. And so we can look at all our publishers by program terms or by status. Okay, so basically you could see here the term status, whether it's active or not, earnings, basically what they've sold over the last basically seven days or three months. So you could look at 
basically how your publishers are performing just by clicking on manage by status here in cj.com so when you're looking at reports in cj.com or really any other affiliate program you might see the acronym epc this stands for earnings per click actually it's a little misleading it's actually earnings per 100 clicks so basically cj calculates you know how much your publisher is actually making per click you know just like paid search we're paying google x amount per click it's the same thing here we can't or these publishers can't make any money if they don't generate clicks so that's why you have an epc model or metric so to speak so you can measure earnings per click cj does it over a seven day period and over a three month period so you could sort based on seven day or three month to see who's earning the most per click in terms of publishers now you can select under publishers groups now you can group your publishers okay so if you have say a group of publishers in a specific region like the united states or india or if you're just focused on the united states and say you have publishers in different states like texas california missouri arkansas well you can group those publishers into different groups and you can look at your different group names here so here we could see canada and so we have our publishers grouped into a group called canada why because they're based in canada makes sense so you want to be able to organize your publishers because the whole idea behind affiliate marketing cj is you want to be able to get the best publishers available for your network and so as you get more publishers for your network you'll be able to basically start grouping them where it makes sense now the example i gave you is by geography you could do by geography or you could do by publisher status meaning my best performing publishers go into a group if they're in a group then they get aligned with a certain program term so you could group your publishers any way you want by status meaning they're selling more these are our best performing publishers or by region or you know by promotion i mean how you group your publishers is totally up to you however take advantage of the option to create publisher groups because the whole idea again i'm going to repeat it is you want to get publishers and you want to start building your base of publishers because the more publishers you have the more chance you are to sell your product remember if nobody clicks on your product then nobody's going to buy your product so if you have publishers who are promoting your product for you then you have a good opportunity to sell it so the more publishers you have on board the better the opportunity so now once you have publishers you can start grouping these publishers accordingly to whatever makes sense it's a business decision just know the options available in cj to group publishers let's turn our attention to social media marketing tools social media always a great topic to talk about so we're going to finish up all our digital marketing tools with social media we talked about seo paid competition affiliate email you know web analytics it's just appropriate to finish up with social media because social media has so many tools available so many okay the first one i can think about here is hootsuite hootsuite is a great social media marketing tool to use okay it's a freemium okay you can set up a free trial here you you basically a base account and then uh, you can use Hootsuite to do a lot of things. Anything from setting up landing pages to actually publishing content to listening. Hootsuite to me is one of the most powerful social media marketing tools available. You got Buffer. Buffer is a paid version, but you can actually set up a low cost or free account actually on Buffer and then move to a paid account. Yeah, you got TweetDeck's been around a long time. That is actually free. And I would recommend TweetDeck. And we're going to take a look at that here in a couple minutes. Okay, and then you got Sprout Social. Sprout Social is another social marketing platform. Similar to Hootsuite. Do a lot of reporting, a lot of publishing. You can, a lot of listening. And so we're going to take a look at Sprout Social today as well. Before we do that, let's go over why these tools are important to us. From a social media perspective, 
you're pumping out a lot of content. So you need to be able to smartly, efficiently, you know, schedule and manage your post. Okay, so you're not just working likely with just one platform like Facebook, you're probably on a number of different platforms, depending on your business, depending on your bandwidth, depending on what you're selling, your products, etc. Your audience obviously has a lot to do with it. You know, it could be Instagram, Pinterest, you want to be able to consolidate all that and manage it in one place. And that's what social media marketing tools do. They allow you to manage everything in one place. So if you can manage everything in one place, then these social media marketing platforms need to be able to make it easy for you to add and manage different accounts. Okay, so a lot of them have the ability for you to add you know, not just one Twitter account, but multiple Twitter accounts and not just one social media platform, but multiple social media platforms and a good social media marketing tool worth its weight will help you monitor the results. So monitor social media posts that help drive leads and sales. In other words, you're going to have a lot of different metrics associated with each social media marketing platform. Okay. Which one is actually doing its job? Okay, so you want to be able to easily manage these platforms, applications, and websites very efficiently. Okay, so instead of having to log into each platform, you just log into one place, get a sense of what's been posted, what the engagement is, did they purchase, etc. And what you want to do is be able to individually customize every social media post across different platforms. So it just makes it a lot easier to do that in these social media marketing tools. Okay, you don't want to send out a blanket message across different platforms. You want to be able to go ahead and customize a post depending on what that post is, depending on what the product is, what time of day, what target market, what target audience. So customization is a lot easier using these social media marketing tools. You want to be able to engage with brand advocates. So listening is a good thing with social media marketing tools, using the listening functionality so you can actually see who is a brand advocate, who's not a brand advocate, who's an influencer, who's not an influencer. And then of course you want to analyze the behavior of your audience and optimize individual posts on real time data. So if, for example, you post something using one of these social media marketing platforms and you see it go viral, then you want to be able to react to that in real time. So you're going to be able to see that in real time on these social media marketing tools, these platforms like Sprout Social and Hootsuite. And then you're going to be able to react to that behavior. And then of course, monitoring website traffic and conversion rates, that's key. We always want to monitor conversions based on our KPIs, our business goals. So there are also a few important digital marketing tools that can help you in different ways. Okay, so without further ado, let's jump in and take a look at what's available in terms of social media marketing. So just a quick reminder, if you are running ads on Facebook or you're posting on Facebook as an example or any platform in general, that platform's going to have its own metrics, if you will. So for example, Facebook has something called Facebook Insights. So you'll be able to actually see, you know, what's been posted based on, you know, the last seven days in this example, how many page views you're getting, engagements, recent posts. So just to let you know, yes, you can go into any one of these platforms on its own and look at metrics. Just like you can do if you're running Facebook ads. Okay, you can go right into Facebook Ads Manager and view data there. Okay, so the whole point here though on using a social media tool is that you can measure all that in one place. So if we log into Sprout Social, I can set up these accounts right into Sprout Social. So I don't have to log in Twitter individually or Facebook individually. I can link them up all within Sprout Social. And then I can go to reports just like I can with Facebook Insights. And then once I'm in Facebook, excuse me, once I'm in Sprout Social reporting, then I can go ahead just like I can in Facebook Insights, except it's all right here for me. I can jump into, you know, Facebook and dig a little bit deeper as to what's going on with my account. So I don't have to log into Facebook directly. I can see, you know, the impressions, the engagement, the clicks over a period of time. I can see my audience growth. 
I can see my publishing behavior, how often am I publishing. I can see the top post individually. I can see impressions by day. You know, a lot of this same material, same information is already in Facebook Insights. So if it's available in Facebook Insights, you know, you're definitely going to have it available in a tool like Sprout Social. So you want to be able to just efficiently log in and jump from one platform to the other. So here, you know, I can go to Instagram, you know, and look at Instagram data, or I can look at Twitter information. So you want to be able to efficiently jump from one platform to the other using, in this example, Sprout Social. Now, as I mentioned, as part of one of the benefits of a social media tool is that you can publish content. You want to be able to publish content because you want to be able to organize and schedule accordingly. You don't want to be submitting and publishing content right after one another. Okay, you want to be able to spread it out efficiently and effectively. And so here, we could see, you know, we could publish and schedule content accordingly. So all we have to do is click compose, select a profile, write whatever we need to do. We could schedule it for tomorrow at a specific time. And there you go, voila, scheduled. So this is on Twitter. Okay, so, you know, we could choose another platform here. It's just that easy to schedule. So you wanna be able to schedule accordingly because again, when you schedule something, then you want to be look at the behavior of it. So it's just as simple as going from publishing to reporting. And then based on when something got published, you could see the reaction of it and react to it. So another thing here that I like about is about social Hootsuite. A lot of these other platforms do it really well. You got listening tools. So you can listen in on conversations that are being had. For example, uh, mail delivery. You know, if we do mail delivery on Twitter search, we'll be able to see what's been tweeted about mail deliveries. You know, if that's the business we're in. We can refine our search and choose a specific location, a radius to hone in if we're local. Okay, so this is Sprout Social's example of listening. Here, let's take a look at another example. I'm in later.com. So later, very similar to Sprout Social in that it does a lot of the same things. You can actually schedule content on a particular platform. And one thing I like about later here, you can actually see it visually. You can see a calendar and what's been scheduled. So I could see today I have scheduled something scheduled at 1.15 local time and again i have five profiles set up for this account so i can pick and choose the profile that i want to publish to so it just makes it that much easier and i can visually see it and that's important so here i can click on media library so the one thing about later.com is that you know you have a library of images that potentially you can reuse so if i click on this image here okay i can get a sense of when it was used and I can view it on a calendar, I can add a label for it. So that's another benefit to later is that they have this media library here. They have conversations. So I can actually connect to a platform and listen in on conversations that are being had, similar to the listening tool in Sprout Social. And they have analytics, so you can actually see right in later.com how your particular social media platform is performing. So I can see it here over seven days. I can see the number of followers have increased. I can see the growth rate. I can see the number of impressions that I've received. Okay, so I want to be able to see how my particular platform's performing over a period of time. So I can look at reach, the lot, profile views, website clicks. Okay, so I can get a lot of good insights here right in the analytics platform of later. You can look at specific post performance. So if we posted something, I could see basically how many likes it received, how many comments, impressions, the reach. And then if I wanted to, I can click on details and get more specific information on it. Engagement rate, okay, discovery, actions, comments, saves, etc. So later.com goes into some nice detail about post performance. They even have data on hashtags. So if you use a hashtag, you can actually see how many times the hashtag's been used or saved, how many impressions it's received. Okay, so they really go into some nice detail here about how your post and how your accounts are performing. And here's a tool I really like, I've been using for a long time, and that's TweetDeck. So what TweetDeck does is connect with your Twitter account. 
So you can see in a different visual, so to speak, of how your Twitter account looks in terms of your feed. Here I can see this is my feed here. Okay, I can see some notifications. I can see specific messages. Then on this column, I can see activity. Okay, so I can add different columns here if I wanted to. And basically by adding columns, you could see I can look for what's trending as an example. So I'm gonna add in a column that says trending. And so now I can go in and see, okay, these are all the different things that are trending on Twitter. Uh, so you can actually add a column and pay attention to something really specific. Okay, so for example, search. Okay, so right now I have men's health, but I could type in, let's just say World Cup. Okay, so I could see that you got the cricket World Cup, you got, you know, the soccer, football World Cup going on. So, you know, we could pick a, a particular topic to follow if we wanted to. So again, here I'm following men's health. So I can now see, you know, everything that's been posted on men's health. Now, if I click on, for example, one of these hashtags here that's trending, I can actually see who's tagging or using that hashtag Friday feeling in their tweets. And so the whole idea behind, you know, TweetDeck, it, it serves up a interesting overview, so to speak, of not only your account, but, you know, a specific topic or what's trending or, you know, other things that are being said. So if you really want to pay attention to your brand or something really specific like, you know, your competitors or a specific product, then you can just do a search on that. And so that's the great thing about TweetDeck. It allows you to kind of just look and listen in on everything going on in Twitter. Now, we do have a good video out here on YouTube, how to start social media marketing. So if you haven't had a chance to look at it, take a look. It goes over some of these tools that we cover today, like Sprout Social, Later.com, you know, Facebook Insights. So it does cover in more detail some of what we covered on these social media marketing tools. So take a look at how to start social media marketing. So we covered a lot of different marketing tools, digital marketing tools, everything from SEO to email to social to paid to affiliate to competitor. But there's also a few other digital marketing tools that you can use in different ways, like video SEO, for example. So vidIQ, you know, we want to use vidIQ to get a good sense of how a particular video is performing. So here, if we go into YouTube, you can see vidIQ is a browser extension or browser a plugin, if you will. So I can go and take a look at a specific, a specific video and see how many hours it's been watched, how many views, minutes watched, subscribers, etc. You know, the great thing here, I can look at the entire, entire account. So I can get good insights into my video or my entire account here just by adding in the vidIQ extension into my Chrome browser. So vidIQ actually does give you some really, really good insights into not only your account, but the video. And so recommend vidIQ because it's good for video SEO. Okay, there's also tools related to content optimization. So, you know, if you're doing SEO and you have a lot of content on your site, well, you know what? We want to be able to use a tool, maybe a third party tool to give some objective reasoning as to what more we can be doing. So you got tools like SEO site checkup or site analyzer. These are paid tools, but you know, if you're really heavily invested in SEO, then they may pay dividends for you. You want to be able to make sure your content is fully optimized to the fullest according to, you know, Google's algorithms. And so you maybe, you know, want to invest in that third party tool. So these are good tools to use for content optimization. You know, there's also other key Reddit, but you know, there's keyword planner, uh, in Google, there's also a uh, word stream. There's a lot of different keyword tools out there. So you may not have a Google ads platform. And so if you don't have Google ads, then you may not be able to gain access to Google's keyword planner. So having a third party keyword tool will pay dividends as well, because those dividends pay off in the form of not only pay per click, but also SEO. And if you're heavily invested in content, heavily invested in social, then you may want to take a look at the keyword tool, keyword it, and it's primarily used for Reddit.
We talk about page load time. So we looked at that in Google Analytics. We know that it heavily impacts SEO. So there are other tools available. You, know, you got a third party tool here that's free, SolarWinds Pingdom. You actually have PageSpeed Insights by Google. So these are free tools that you could take advantage of in determining how you can improve your page load time. My favorite topic, conversion rate optimization. So you got a couple in here, Crazy Egg and Zargit. Okay, so I'm gonna show you another tool called Hotjar. So here, if you log into hotjar.com, you can set up an account. It's actually free. And with a free account, you can have Hotjar measure the heat map, not only the heat map, but the click mapping, the scrolling of a particular page. And so here you can see we're looking at a particular page here. So Hotjar allows me to, you know, see on that page where people are clicking. Um, I can also see where people are moving. I can also see, you know, the scrolling of a particular page. Okay, so you can see here on the page, I can see people are moving over here to the right. And that's where they're clicking mo mostly. If I switch over to move mode, then I can see on that particular page, where people are actually moving their mouse and then i have my scroll analysis so i could see you know how far down people actually scroll on the page and so again with a paid account you can measure up to 10,000 page views with the free version you can measure up to 2,000 page views and so 2,000 page views allows you to get some insight as to what people are clicking on or where they're moving or how they're scrolling on a particular page. And so I definitely recommend Hotjar. They also do funneling, they also do forms, polls, lots of other tools available in Hotjar. So hotjar.com is a tool I would recommend as well. So one final tool, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it, and that's Google Optimize. So Google Optimize is a Google platform that allows you to A-B test. And so A-B testing means that you have an original page and you're changing one element on that page to see which one performs better. And so with Google Optimize, it's just very easy to set up to run and the whole point of Google Optimize and A-B testing is to improve website performance. So here you can see I have an account set up and optimize. You can see we're running one test here and we're just testing one element versus the original. So we move photos to the top of the page. The original didn't have the photos to the top of the page. And so we can go into reporting here. Google Optimize does all the heavy lifting. And so here you can see we can look at bounces or we can look at, you know, basically a measure the test up against the metric that's important to our business. And again, the whole point is to improve website performance. And so definitely take a look at Google Optimize. We'll have another webinar in the future on the topic. But, you know, to me, Google Optimize is free. You can run up to five tests. Okay. And if you can run up to five different tests, then that means you have the ability to really improve website performance. Okay. So Google Optimize is a tool that I would recommend. Okay. So we could probably go on for a few more hours on all the different various types of digital marketing tools that are out there on the internet. We covered a lot of them from paid to email to social. A lot of them are free. A lot of them are paid versions. In between, you got freemium. So go out there, experiment, have fun, play around. If you have a tool we didn't cover that you feel our audience should know about, then go ahead and put them in the comments section under this video. Thanks for hanging in there. Covered a lot of good information today. I want to thank you for paying attention. If you have any more information, please visit us at simplylearn.com. Thank you. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.